Wow. Well, I was scheduled for seven meetings, and this is number seven. Time goes quick, doesn't it, eh? Wow. When I was with, um, when we'd finished praying uh, for three and a half years every night, um, I mean, 24 7, every minute I met. Um, I, I wondered if I'd heard the Lord, you know. And uh, I felt certain that God wanted us to pray like the Moravians and not stop. And I, I would tell my people if the Moravians did it for a hundred years and sent out missionaries out of that mission base to the four corners of the world, then, then we can do it. And so it was a bit of a sad day when I announced to the church that we were closing the house of prayer. And uh, the, re the reason was be it was just getting um, stressful for me. It was getting hard to get the people and the personnel. And I'm always one that if something is, a, is dying, kill it. Do you know what I mean? Or else all you do is you fix to it bad memories. And, um, and you, ne you never want that with anything. So I I've killed a lot of things, not people, but I've killed a lot of things. I've probably killed a lot of people as well, figuratively speaking. Um, because I just, I don't like things dying. I'd rather just, if it's the end, then Lord, it's the end. But... Last year, I went on a sabbatical, uh, 2012, and just because I was, I was worn out, we had a really tough two years with Rachel before she went into her residential school, and uh, my wife and I were not doing particularly good in ourselves. We were um, struggling emotionally and uh and physically and so um i asked i asked her if she would come with me to america but to be quite honest it was just it was just too much for her and i asked do you mind if i go because i i feel the lord has some things for me and so i just phoned a few friends and i just said can i hang out can i just come and and just hang out with you and uh, they said sure come and you know, and they would, they would always ask me to preach, um, even though I, it wasn't a preaching tour. But one of the places that I went to was IHOP, Kansas City. And I've known Mike Bickle for 15 years. He's been a really dear friend of mine. I've had him in Sunderland at conferences. And uh, let me tell you something about Mike. You know, there's... There's a couple of people in the world right now that I admire for one thing, and that is their upward connection to the Lord. And uh, there are two people that, that just inspire me when it comes to that vertical relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. One of them is Mike Bickle, and the other is Heidi Baker. You might have heard of her. And I'm, I'm privileged to call them both friends. And whenever I'm around them, I'm just, I'm convicted. <laughs> because I feel I'm just so small in comparison to their expression of their, their life before the Lord. Anyway, I sat down with Mike and he said, Prophetically, he looked across the table and he said, Ken, we have been praying for you for two years that you would hear the Lord to build the house of prayer. And I said, you are kidding. And he said, no, I'm, we've been praying. I said, why? Why were you praying for me? And he said, because you're part of our prophetic journey. And you know, Mike is big on 
the prophetic journey of how the Lord led him. And then he just went through certain things where my life had collided with theirs. For instance, even before IHOP started, he had on staff a man by the name of Noel Alexander. And if you want to know what God might look like, just look at Noel. And, and, and also, um, if, you want to, if you want to see into the eyes of what the Lord might look like, his eyes are just so striking. And he has this white hair brushed back and just this austere look about him. I, I tremble in his, when I'm with him. But anyway, he came to a conference in Sunderland. And back then, I had a tower block, 10 stories, 10 stories of offices. Have I ever told you this? I think I might. And right on the top was a, a prayer room. My offices were on the top. And, right, and that prayer, that tower block was actually given to me. Three businessmen came up to me one day and said, there's the keys that was called Crown House. There's the keys to Crown House. And I said, what do you mean? He says, we bought it for you, the three of us, out of our businesses. We've bought it for you, and it's for you. And so I moved my ministry onto the top floor, and I put a prayer room there. And I got Noel Alexander to come and dedicate it, because he came out of Mike Bickle's ministry. So I, I asked him to come, and we had a dedication service. And um, for some reason, the lift wasn't working. The elevator wasn't working. And, and it, we had to walk up to the 10th floor. And I had a whole lot of people there. And one of, the only rule for the prayer room was that you took your shoes off. And you just left them outside. That was the only rule we had. Well, we had, well that isn't strictly true. But in terms of your apparel, okay, you took your shoes off. And he stopped and he looked at these shoes. And, and he went in and he was distracted. I'm trying to get his attention to dedicate this prayer room. And he's just somewhere else. In this prayer room, you could look over the North Sea. It was really high because 10 stories. And you could look over the... So you could look towards Europe. You couldn't see Europe because of the horizon, but you could look and you could visualize. Like, for instance, on the parallel with us, the first country you'd come to would be Germ uh, Denmark. And then you could then just imagine Germany under that, and then Holland and, and Belgium and, and France, Spain, Italy. And you could just, and we would pray for Europe from there. So, he gets the, he, he, I said, I'd like to hand over to Mike, uh, to, to Noel Alexander. And he said, before I say anything, I have to tell you something. He said, um, there is a prophet in America called Bob Jones. And uh, he told me something that the Lord had given him. And it's funny how the Lord does certain things. It's like, you know, I read out um, about the, Sh uh, the Shunammite woman. It was in the pastor's meeting. That Elisha doesn't talk to her direct. He talks to his servant to talk to her. And, and sometimes the Lord just does it that way. And so he gives, the Lord gives Bob Jones a dream to give to Noel Alexander that when it is fulfilled, the dream, to tell Mike Bickle. It's the ways of God are past finding out. And the dream was, you will climb a mountain, and when you see the shoes at the top of the mountain, tell Mike Bickle it is time to launch the 24-7 house of prayer. And he told us that. And he said, I am going back to tell Mike it is now time. And then that was the first intervention. And then I had about three or four where my life clashed with Mike's. 
And it was, I'm part of the prophetic journey of IHOP, Kansas City. So that's why they were praying for me. And then he said this to me. I would inquire of you, Ken, and I would hear the report would be, he hasn't heard yet. He hasn't heard yet. And they were convinced that one day I would hear. And now I'm sitting opposite him, and I said, do you know why I'm here? He says, because you've heard. And I said, yeah, I've heard, Mike. And he said, can you need to resign your church? And I did that. I went back and resigned. And he says, you need to give your life to raising up a house of prayer with a missions base in a school. He says, I would do it in London. So I've ignored that bit. <laughs> he only said London because he probably thinks that's what England is, London. And when I, when I started this journey, I thought that's what it was. I thought one house of prayer in Sunderland, 24-7, with a school and a missions base. And then the Lord told me, who told you that? Who told you just one? And I said, Lord, this will take my life. Just this one. And it was almost like the Lord said, no, I've made you a fire starter. You know, that's what happened last year here in this place. I have put an anointing on you to start things. If you continue with them, it ain't going to work. So I don't know how long the start is, but there'll come a time when I'll, I will stop being the senior a person, if you like, with my wife in that house of prayer, and, and we'll go and do another. And the Lord says, I want you to plant them all over Europe. But he says, I want you to plant them not like Kansas City, not like your friend Mike. I want you to plant them with a, a river expression. Do you know what I mean by that? Just a, a flow of the Holy Spirit where actually in it is healing, inner healing, and physical healing, and, and the flow of the Holy Spirit, just like we experienced here in, in this worship. Lots of harp and bowl, because that's a sustainable model. That's what keeps you going. But interjected with those times where the river of God just flows. I had no sooner given myself to saying, and this is very recent, this is like just a few weeks old, I'd said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. When, when, when we've established Sunderland, then we'll do another. And then I get word that I hop London want me to take over that house of prayer. And so that would put me in the north of England and in the capital city. And then when I'm with people, like your pastor, and not just him, but others, I hear all the time now, we want a 24-7 house of prayer. And you know, I feel that this is on God's agenda like never before, like never before, that God is calling his people for this last end time move. He's calling his people to 24-7 constant prayer. You know, I have another friend who taught me a lot in prayer, and his name's Lou Engel. And Lou says, you know, if we don't establish these prayer houses, then we don't contend. We need to rise up and contend with the Muslim house of prayer. Those guys pray five times a day. So who's contending with the Muslim house of prayer? Who's contending with the Hindu temples? Who, who is contending with the other multi-faiths that, that have prayer at the core of what they do? I appreciate your gift tonight and last night. It's the only income I receive in relation to 
the vision that I have. My church, Beshan, um, it pays pastors and staff members. It doesn't pay the house of prayer. So I appreciate it. And if you feel that you would like to partner, even if it's just for a year, and, and really, I know that there are projects that are near and dear, but if you can, I would appreciate that as well. In 2 Kings 4, it says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be with his slaves. The backdrop to this is that I feel that this is a young man that's died prematurely. And just because I feel like the sons are not, are not very old. And so I think this is a young man that's died without warning. And that he had given his life to be trained in the prophetic school of Elisha as a, as a prophet. And it is probable that in order to do that, he took out a loan from a loan shark, and he used his sons as collateral. And I think, I think we can safely say that this is probably the deal here. So while he's in the midst of his training, he dies. And so the loan can't be paid, and he hasn't entered into ministry, and the person who has given the loan is now coming back. And if the loan can't be paid, then he's going to take the two boys. She is really mad about this, and through her grief and, and the loss of her husband, I think she is screaming at Elisha. And she is saying to him, basically, this is your fault. He came and gave his life and to follow you and to be schooled by you. This should not happen. Now he's dead, but, but what's as bad as that is that the creditor is coming for my two sons and I'm going to have nothing left and I'm blaming you. Can you see that here? I'm blaming you. And so Elisha says, well, what do you want me to do about it? What do you want me to do about it? It's almost like he's saying, you know what? We all need to take responsibility for our own choices. And how often does the pastor get blamed? How often have I been blamed? I said, listen, it wasn't my fault. What do you want me to do about it? You made the choice. We gave you counsel. We told you what, and, but you made the choice at the end of the day. You know, we have a great disclaimer. We who are in full-time ministry. And that is, we refuse to control your life. We refuse to tell you what to do and what not to do. What, not. what we can do is advise. What we can do is say, well, you know, the word of God says this. We can't say, I feel in the spirit that actually, you know, this, this would be a better choice than that. But ultimately, we make our own choices and we need to stand on what we ourselves have done. You know, God wants a mature church. He wants his body to be mature. And Paul said, why, why are you tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine? You know, we need to know the word. And we need to know the things of the Holy Spirit. And we need to know what pleases God and what displeases God. And we need to do the things that please Him with all of our heart. So I can understand this. My wife, who's a high responder, she would have difficulty with that. Because, you know, she would want arms around this woman. And never mind, you know, we're going to take you through, you know... In a healing, whatever in a healing program is available, and, 
and we're going to sort this out, never mind, and we're going to get some money, and we're going to take up offerings, and we're going to do this. She's just that type. But I'm not. <laughs> we got a guy in our church, and he's, he's about six foot five. He's a huge guy. And he got married recently, late, late on. He got married. And actually, he was 50 years old when he got married. And, uh, and I married them. You know, I felt um, okay about this. You know, they fell in love, made their choice. And, and so because I'm the pastor of the church, they got married. It wasn't a massive, big wedding. It was just a very small affair. And, uh, you know, it was just a small number of people at the reception. There's a few speeches. So it's a very low-key kind of deal. And uh, he got it into his head that the Lord wanted to send him back to South Africa with his new bride and to plant a church. And he came to me and he said, uh, I feel this is what the will of God is. And I said, have you really heard God on this? And he said, absolutely. And I said, and, and, and has the Lord really spoken? Without a doubt. He says, I know this as much as as I'm looking at you and you are real. I know this. And I'm going, whoa, not much room for negotiation here. <laughs> it's kind of like it's a done deal and he's, he's not asking me, he's telling me. Well, if he didn't that week, just quit his job. Quit his job as an electrical engineer. I mean, a great job, well paid. And his wife was a dentist, and he, and, and he told her to quit her job. So he's like, high earners, all of a sudden, they're jobless. They've packed their bags, they've sold their stuff, and they're sitting in an empty house. And of course, it just doesn't happen. They're, nothing happens from South Africa. He actually gets his money, he had enough money to go and get a, a plane ticket and, and he went and scouted around, he came back and there was nothing, there was no door opening, nothing, nothing at all. Their savings went down, he couldn't get back into employment, she had to just take casual work as a dentist if there was just somebody sick or whatever and he's penniless and he's coming to the church and he's, he's saying, why aren't you bothered about us? We haven't got food to eat. We haven't got this. You're not praying with us. You're not doing this. And it was like, and I'm getting it. I'm thinking, what do you want me to do about it? I just remembered the words of Elisha. <laughs> what do you want me to do about it? So I just sent Lois into that one, you know. I said, <laughs> Over to you, responder. <laughs> now he has a job, thank goodness, but I tell you, he went down, 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 like you wouldn't believe. God wants maturity in his body. He doesn't want things like that. To happen. Now, I don't know why I'm saying that, because you know what? I have never, ever said that before, ever. But I kind of think it must be for somebody here tonight. Take counsel. Make sure you hear God, especially if they're life-changing decisions. Especially if they are. And my cry is, let's get some maturity back to the church. Yeah? Where we're hearing God, doing his will. And Elisha says, what do you want me to do about it? And he says, what do you have in the house? And she says, nothing. That's just the mood she was in. You know, when you're in a bad mood, you've got nothing. 
You're not happy? Are you happy? No. <laughs> Do you have anything? Nothing. And that's just how it is. One bad thing happens to you and everything, everything is rubbish. <laughs> Your life sucks. Everything, it's just... <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? I am. Am I allowed to say that? Uh oh. I'm telling you, I get into trouble sometimes. I mean, my goodness. I could go somewhere with that, but I'm not. I'm going to keep on task. Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has got nothing. In the house. But a jar of oil. See, we always have something. While we're drawing breath, we always have something. There is always the, that deposit of the Holy Spirit within us. Now, we're going, we're going from empty tonight, or wherever you are, to full to overflowing. That's the journey I'm taking you on. Might take me a while to get there, but we will get there. So I'm just talking to the ones that are feeling really empty. It's like you can identify with this. I've got a little bit of oil. Well, we're going to move you to full tonight. And then we're going to move you to overflowing. Because that's the God I know. I only know the God of the overflow. Uh, it's his nature to overflow. David, the psalmist, knew that. He said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And in that psalm, he said, my, my cup runneth over. Yeah, yeah. But what... I mean, what is the use of that? Have you ever thought about it? He says, my cup runneth over. I mean, that's just extreme wastage. I don't want an overflowing cup. I want it just so I can get it back to my table without <laughs> spilling it. Don't overflow it. But God can't. You see, the reason why David said that is because, because God doesn't measure he just pours. Come on. <laughs> Woo! Write that down. That was a good one. I've never said that before. That was, that was a good one. God, <laughs> God doesn't measure. He just pours. <laughs> So he says, well, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. Because I think if I wrote the Bible, I would say this. That Elisha then says to her, we're going to move this thing then. We're going to shift it from where you are to where you haven't even dreamed of. And he said, this is how we're going to do it. You're going to get empty vessels. And you're going to pack as many empty vessels into your house as possible you and your sons, and you're going to shut the door, and then you're going to take this jar of oil, and then you are going to pour the oil into the empty vessels. When you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you. You know, there's a lot of good, good stuff happens in secret. Did you know that? Did you know a lot of good stuff happens behind shut doors? Yeah. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her, her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass... When the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said, there is not another vessel. 
Bring me another vessel. Maybe she said, go back to those neighbors and see if there's another empty vessel. And the boy comes back and says, there's not one. But here's what happens. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, pay off the creditor. Pay off the one that you owe the debt to. Now, that would have been good, wouldn't it? That would have solved the immediate problem. Just the paying of the debt. But God isn't like this. You see, you've got to believe that he's either the God of the overflow or he isn't. So, she is going to be taken from a place of emptiness, of crisis, to a place where actually her life will change forever because the prophet didn't just say pay off the the guy that you owe the debt to pay the loan off but he said listen to this listen to it he says pay your debt and you and your sons live on the rest live on the rest I want to add something to that for the rest of your life that's what God's like live on the rest For the rest of your life, there was so much oil that poured. There were so many vessels that got filled that actually she could pay the loan off and sell the rest. Whenever people had need of oil, she would always have enough to sell for the rest of her life. How much oil was that? How much was it? I mean, think about it. We're talking about, you know, I used to imagine this little story where it was just a few vessels coming in there. Oh, that's good. But you know what? I think we're talking about a vast amount of oil here. A vast amount to sustain her and our sons for the rest of our life. Go to John 2. Please. It wasn't a command. It was a suggestion. (laughs) It says on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern, now notice notice the wording here, what does your concern have to do with me? So again, you can read into this and kind of, you can just see what this deal's all about. Here's a wedding. And I don't think Jesus is actually one of the guests. He's there in attendance, but I think the invite comes to Mary. That she's the one invited. And not only that, but she's close with either the bride or the groom, or at least the wedding party. There's a closeness there, a relationship, a friendship, which is more than casual. Because... She finds out that they've run out of wine. Now, the rest of the guests, they wouldn't have had a clue, but those that were close in, they were given that information. There's no more wine left. And so she's concerned. And that's why Jesus said, what has your concern got to do with me? So really, Jesus is just there with his disciples. He's just enjoying the wedding feast. It's his mom that's really the one that's there helping it out and maybe part of, part of the group that put it together. And there's a problem. And that is that the wedding has run out of wine. Now, it's not ferment. It's not unfermented grape juice. It's wine. So just take your 
First Baptist hat off or, or Pentecostal hat or whatever it is. It's real wine. Now, don't worry. Because, you know, this is like still old covenant. They're still under the law, as it were. So we're fine, aren't we? We're okay? Half's just walked out right there now. <laughs> They've run out of wine. And Jesus says, well, that's your concern, but it's not mine. But what son can ever say this? That it's a problem that my mother has, but it's not mine. I mean, if she has a problem, she will make it yours. <laughs> right? It's like, <laughs> you're my son... And so my problem is yours. My concern is your concern. You see, the dynamics of mother and son, it never changes no matter how old you get. You're still her little boy. I walk into a house and I'm 10. I'm a fully grown man. I'm, I'm known around the world. But when I walk in there, I'm not Ken to her, by the way. I'm Kenneth. <laughs> I told you this, didn't I? I walk in, and the first thing she always asks me is, where have you been? <laughs> she doesn't care if I've been anywhere in the world. What she's really saying is, where have you been that you haven't been here? <laughs> Sometimes I shake. Because <laughs> I'm trying to think, why haven't I been where have I been? <laughs> and you know when she texts me, she always puts these little, these little kisses on her. <laughs> and sometimes I text her back and I forget to put the little kisses back. So she'll send me a text with just kisses on. See? See, I know what that means. That means I'm in trouble when I get home. <sighs> and she's in my church as well. I just thought I'd mention that. So his mother said, his mother, so I can hear my mother saying, he'll do it. I remember, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell you this, because she's not here. No. I'm, I was hosting a conference, and uh, we had uh, guests from all over the world. And uh, this prophet, well-known prophet, and his wife were there just as delegates. That's all. And so they'd registered, and they were there in the crowd, and she'd spotted them. And they had said to my mother, we have a prophetic word for your son. But we can see he's very busy and we don't want to give it publicly. We just, we just would like to share it with him. So that was it. The next thing I know, lunchtime. She said, I've got your lunch. And I said, what do you mean? I have a green room. I have people waiting for me. She says, no, you're not going today. <laughs> I'm hosting this conference in case you don't realize, like I'm the big cheese at the minute. <laughs> like I'm t I tell people this, that, and I'm hosting it. She says, no, but do you know that Ken Newton and his wife are here and I said, really, that's nice. He has a word for you. And I told him he could have lunch with you today. So I've plated up your lunch, and they're in that room waiting for you. You can't do that. I said, you can't do that. But you see, if it's your mom, she can. She just can't. And she just did it. 
So I went in there, and the plate's in, and I said, I'm not eating, I'm not eating anything. <laughs> so I just sat there. And Ken Newton said, I have a word for you. I want to tell you, the word he gave me, Glenn, no kidding, it was life-changing. Life, life-changing. He told me this, he told me that, he told me this. And I'm going, huh, huh, huh. I said, Mom, come here, Mom. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> this is what's happening here. Whatever he, whatever he says, just do it. Wow. And so Jesus does it for this, all the reasons I've just told you. The reasons why you do it. And you might want to spiritualize this and sermonize it, and that's fine. But I actually think this is just, just mom and her boy. He hasn't been revealed as the Messiah. This is just the dynamics are still going on. And he says... Take those six water pots of stone and fill them with water. And the Bible tells us there was, um, they, were, they were there for the purification of the Jews. And they contained 20 to 30 gallons each. Think about that. 20 to 30 gallons each and there's six of them. And they filled the water pots, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some of it out and take it to the wedding planner. Take it to the master of the feast. And he took it, and he tasted it. And the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made into wine, and he didn't know where it had come from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew that the master of the feast, so the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said, every man gives at the beginning the good wine. And he gives the rubbish stuff to them at the end. Why? Because they've had so much that they can't tell good from bad at the end. It's just... It's just logical, common sense. Now, you can spiritualize that, but that's how it is. But you've kept the good wine till now. And I read that and I'm thinking, that was a waste. That was just a waste. I mean, why just give them wine? Why didn't Jesus just give them wine? Instead of the very best. It's like the, the master of the feast could taste that this was great wine. And I don't think they needed all these gallons of wine. I don't think the fix for this problem was as much wine as was made. Jesus could have said, fill one of those jars. But he said, fill all six. There's 800 bottles of wine in that. I worked it out. <laughs> I wanted to know. There's 800 bottles of the best wine. And it's not all going to get drunk. I mean, they've already drank a lot. We're talking about just a little bit just to see it to the end. And then everybody be happy, but there's 800 bottles of the best wine ever. Who do you think gets that? Do you know who I think got it? I think when the wine read out, the bride and the groom were feeling a bit of shame. And they were just feeling a bit of sadness because their wedding was not what it was supposed to be. And I think that that was just a wedding present from the Father have 800 bottles of the best Bordeaux you could ever have. Or whatever your favorite wine is. Have it as a wedding present from me. 
because that's what the Father's like. I think half a dozen bottles of wine would have done it. Eight hundred. Because God's like that. He wanted, Jesus wanted them to know that his heavenly Father was the God of abundance. The God of overflow. The God, has no, the God who has no measurement within him. He's a God that knows how to measure. He just refuses. And he just pours. We'll get a bit more spiritual now. We'll get off wine. When Jesus was going to call his disciples, they had toiled all night. They hadn't caught anything. He's teaching the multitude, and he asks Peter if he could go out into his boat. He teaches the multitude, and when he's finished, he says to Peter, Take, let's go out to the deep. Let down your net for a catch. And Peter says, Master, we've toiled all night, and we've caught nothing. But because you've said it, I'll do it. Now, Jesus was not at, Peter was not a disciple. This is uh, Luke 5. Peter was not a disciple. He was not a follower. He wasn't, he was around Jesus. And, you know, he was familiar with him. And he knew him, and I think he liked him a lot. But he wasn't ready to follow him. In fact, even, you know, when the sermon is being preached, he's not really part of the crowd. He's, he, he's concerned about how much fish he's going to catch for the village because he was out all night and he, he didn't catch a thing. But Jesus is going to, he's going to offer him a position on his team. And so he takes them out to the deep and he says, let down your net. And Peter does what Jesus asks him to do and he lets down his net. And when he had done this, verse 6, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. This is crazy. I mean, again, when I used to read this, I thought that Peter had a little rowing boat in my mind. Have you ever thought that? And he was just rowing out there. And, and so he fills his little rowing boat and the other guys there in their little rowing boat and they come in the two little rowing boats are starting to sink. But these boats are not little rowing boats. And if you've, who's been to Israel on Galilee and they've taken you out there? and So you know that these are big boats, right? I mean, you need a crew. So it's not just, when he says Peter launch out, he's saying, he's saying crew, come on, we're going out of the deep. He's not just there in his own. I mean, he needs other men because this boat cannot be handled by one single person. And I mean, the boats, I mean, how big are they, Glenn? I mean, they're huge things, right? And we're reading here that the catch was so big, so immense, that the nets begin to break. And when they get, when they get the catch into these boats, boats his boat is sinking i mean how do you sink a boat they're made to float well they are in england <laughs> and yet either the bible is is not telling the truth and i refuse to believe that i refuse to believe it's a made-up story I believe that for reasons that I can't fully appreciate, there was so much fish caught that actually that boat was probably made for a great catch that was kind of possible on a good night. 
But this has gone way over the top. And because the boat is going down to the bottom of the sea, Peter calls his partner and they fill a second one so that both boats are in jeopardy of sinking. They just get back to the shore. How much fish do you think they landed? I mean, tons of this stuff. Tons of it. Why? I tell you, just a good catch would have done it. Can you hear what I'm saying tonight? That we can settle for a good one. Or we can go for the overflow. We can settle for the debt had been paid or the credit had been paid. We can pay off the loan or we can live on the rest. We can have a few bottles of wine just to get us through the wedding ceremony or we can have so much, it's just unbelievable. It's just ridiculous. We can have a few catch of fish. We can just have a few, which would be a good night. Or we can have so many that our boats are sinking. It's a choice. It comes down to that. God is no, no, well, he doesn't favor one against the other. What am I trying to say? He's no respecter of persons. He loves me as much as he loves you, and he loves you as much as he loves me. Do you know I came into this because I chose to? I'm not a man of great wealth at all. When I told you I bought a Mercedes, it was an old one. <laughs> well, it was six year old. Is that old? No. Okay. So I'm not a man of wealth. I live among poor people. I choose to do that. I live among the poor of Sunderland. But I live in the abundance. I live in the outrageous abundance of God. He's outrageous. <laughs> and do you know why I do that? Because I chose to. I never ask God just to meet my needs. Now, I know he promises and everything else, but actually the God that I know goes beyond that all the time. And so I, I never say, Lord, if you could just help me with this, I just expect my daddy God to overflow like King David knew the overflow. I just know the God that doesn't know how to measure. Now, why did he give them these fish? I think it was like this. I mean, it's just a theory, but it fits tonight. He was about to call Peter as a disciple. I believe the number one concern in that man's mind would be, what about the village? I'm the guy that catches the fish for them. And I think when Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men, he also said, and you needn't worry about the village. I've taken care of that as well. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. Woo! And he was able, he was able, the Bible says, to leave everything and follow Jesus. Glory. We're nearly done. Woo! Give. And it will be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. And running over and all of that will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this 
says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. It seems like God is unconcerned about his wastage. He's unconcerned that, that the running cup means wine's running all over the place. And it seems, I would say, that's a waste. He's unconcerned that there's rotten fish on the beach. He's unconcerned that wedding guests can't drink 800 bottles of, of absolutely brilliant, fantastic wine. It says in the Bible when he created the world, he made two lights. He made the sun and he made the moon. And then we get this throwaway comment, and he made the stars also. That's it. It's like just, oh, and he made the stars. <laughs> Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. As the stars of the heaven. And he told Abraham, move out of your tent, just start counting. Impossible task. I found a little nugget of truth um, in Wikipedia or somewhere about the stars. And, and basically it's this that nobody has a clue how many are out there. They haven't a clue. And yet he told Abraham to count them. It's not fair, that. But never mind. I think God was just having a little chuckle at that one. You see, there are so many stars out there. We're never going to see them. Man will never see the stars in the heavens. He will never design and invent a telescope big enough to, to trace and count every star. It'll never, ever happen. They have a kind of a measurement, and this was the little nugget that I found. They have a kind of a measurement just to guess how many might be out there. And they do it by just counting what they can and then just multiplying in what they believe are how many galaxies. And then they come up with a number that you can't even say. But basically, it's like this. What they know, and this is what they know, we know that there are six billion people that live on the earth right now. Okay? Six billion. This is not the people who have died. This is... Not historic. This is now about 6 billion people live on planet Earth. And they reckon that if you gave every one of those 6 billion a trillion stars as a personal gift, like you would own a trillion of the stars, 6 billion owning a trillion each, they said, we might get somewhere near how many are out there. <gasps> what a waste. What a waste of stars. I mean, God's just thrown them out there. Nobody's ever going to see them. But it seems like he couldn't care. So what? It's my nature. It's what I do. It's what I am. It's how I am. It's how he is with the Holy Spirit. You see, you can, you can have a decent infilling or you could go for the overflow tonight. You can go for 
an amount of the Holy Spirit that'll just give you a feel-good factor. That'll make you a little bit happier than when you came in. Or you can go for the infilling that overflows. <laughs> From an overflowing God that doesn't know how to measure just poor. Oh, I like that. I got saved when I was 17 and I got a measure of the Holy Spirit, right? Because that's what happens. He comes and dwells within you by His Spirit. So you get a measure of the Spirit. How many Christians are living in the measure? On planet Earth right now, they're living in the measure. Whole denominations living in the measure. Good men, good women, but they're living in the measure. But that is never the nature of God. That is never the will of God. That is never what God has for each and every one of us. How about refusing to live in the measure? How about accepting only that I will be satisfied only with the overflow, only with the abundance, only with the apparent wastage of God, the apparent wastage of God. My cup overflows. I'm Pentecostal, and I'm preaching this on Pentecost. Yeah, there's a never been a better time than right now to experience the overflow. This isn't a running over cup now. This isn't 800 bottles of wine. This is not fish stacked up on the beach. This is not oil out of a, out of a jar. No, come on. This is much, much better than any of that. As much as you were amazed and astounded at that, this is much better. The precious Holy Spirit is given by God in the same way that he gave oil, in the same way that he gave wine, in the same way that he gave fish. He gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Peter, standing up full of the Holy Spirit, Hallelujah. preached out of the overflow, and 3,000 got saved. I'm nearly done. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that they had any of the things he possessed, that it was his own, but they had all things in common. And great power, with great power, with great power. You see, the great power Hallelujah. is in the overflow. Yeah. It's not in the measure. It's in the overflow. With great power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And if you back up, you'll find why. Verse 31 of Acts 4. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. I tell you, overflow shakes buildings. Overflow will shake you. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Because out of the overflow, you will become bold. 
One more. And then we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Do not be drunk with wine. So, all right, you can forget about that wine story. <laughs> this is me getting myself off the hook. <laughs> and do not be drunk with wine. I don't want you coming to me and saying, God gave me 800 bottles and I drank the lot. <laughs> Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Out of the overflow. Yes. Worship is great when it's in the overflow. Amen. I got saved when I was 17 and I got a measure. But because I'm Pentecostal, somebody told me I could have an overflow. We called it back then the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But really it's just the overflow. And so on a Monday night in a boiler house prayer meeting, you went to the front if you wanted the overflow. And you knelt on these front seats and I knelt. I, I knelt with my measure. And on the first Monday night, it was always a Monday night, I got prayed for and nothing happened. So I went back the second week. And I said, God, I'm not happy with the measure. I didn't use those words. I just said, I want the baptism. And I got prayed for again, and nothing happened. And the third time I said to God, if I don't get it tonight, just kill me. 17 years old. I mean, you are stupid when you're 17, aren't you? You just say things, and they are stupid. I've been with Philip all day and he's 19 and it doesn't get much better actually when you're 19. <laughs> when you're a teenager, you say stupid things, don't you? You say, God, if you do not give me this tonight, you can kill me. I'm so glad he didn't kill me. <laughs> but anyway, that's how I felt. And I knelt down. And ooh, it was different. Something was up. And the pastor came down. He used to come down the line. And before he ever got near me, something came in hit the soles of my feet and started coming back up and when it got back up to here I was a mess before Toronto I was a mess I was speaking in tongues I was shaking I was crying I was in the overflow I was experiencing the measure. No, I was experiencing the outflow from a God that doesn't know how to measure. And I was thinking, I think that's enough. And it just kept coming. And it just kept coming. And it just kept coming. I had to be dragged out of that church. I couldn't stop. I opened my mouth. I was speaking tongues. I couldn't sleep all night, 17 years old. And then when I got my language back, which is English, in case you're wondering, <laughs> I couldn't stop singing praises. I went into work 
as a crime scene investigator. You didn't know that, did you? CSI. <laughs> they made a whole television series about me. <laughs> and with boldness, I told them what had happened. My mother, my mom, who loved me a lot, but was just getting a bit phased at the fact that I wouldn't shut up. She says, do you have to sing everywhere you're at in the house? And I said, I don't think so, but I don't want to stop. I was in the overflow because that's the God I know when Toronto came I could have said give me a measure and then I'll just go back to my church and it'll be a little bit better than it is no give me the abundance Give me everything and more. I'm going to Toronto in October, September for the 20th Catch the Fire. 20 years I've been like this. <laughs> and in 20 years time, I'll be worse. I'm taking Pastor Glenn with me. Has he told you about this yet? <laughs> he did say, maybe Denise will come. He did say that. So I'm taking him up there. <clears throat> Philip wants to come, but until he stops speaking rubbish, we can't really let him come. We have had so f much fun, I'll tell you. Anyway. I went to the first Catch the Fire. That's why I'm going to the 20th, because every, all the originals are there. Randy Clark, Mike Bickle, Lou Engel, Wes Campbell, Stacey Campbell, all these guys. We're all, all there 20 years later, thanking God. Because we didn't experience a measure in those early days. I went to the first one and preached at the second one. And then preached at a number in the last 20 years. I would crawl there to thank God for the overflow that's come into my life. And I want to tell you there's enough in me right now. To impart some of that to you tonight. I asked the Lord. And I haven't preached this for a while. And I haven't really done it like I've done it tonight. I'll be honest with you. I've just had to put it together for you. But I asked the Lord. Just to do for you. What you want him to do tonight. Because I'm like this because I choose it. I just made a choice. And I'm asking you just to make a choice tonight. Holy Spirit, not a measure tonight. But let it pour to overflowing. Stand to your feet. I'm going to ask Jason to, or Elizabeth to lead us in a song. And as they are singing this, I'm going to invite you to come and stand on a blue line. Well, the Holy Spirit's already invited you, so you can do what you like. Okay. We wait for 
for you.